Welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist. Um, I am Dr. Victoria Meadows. I'm a professor of astronomy at the University of Washington, and I also work as the director of the UW's Astrobiology program, and that is a graduate uh, program where we actually train uh, young scientists to be astrobiologists. Um, and my other hat is as the principal investigator for the Virtual Planetary Laboratory um, at the NASA Astrobiology Institute. So, um, as you can tell from all of those roles, I, I spend a lot of my time doing administration of science, and so I, um, I am both a scientist and a science administrator. Um, when I'm doing my science, um, I'm working on trying to understand how we would recognize and characterize habitable exoplanets. Um, so planets found orbiting around other stars, trying to learn what their environments might be like, um, whether or not they're capable of harboring life and doing all of that from, you know, a, a very great distance, from a distance to sort of the nearby stars. So uh, my research group, the Virtual Planetary Laboratory, focuses around a single question, which is if we were to find, say, a terrestrial type exoplanet, a rocky planet orbiting around another star, uh, would we be able to recognize whether or not it was able to harbor life or it had life on it? And so the whole team works towards trying to understand what planetary environments are like and how life makes an impact on a planetary environment that might be visible over very large distances. So that's the scientific research we work on sort of in a nutshell. Um, on the educational side, um, as I said, we have the academic program at the University of Washington um, where we take in graduate students for a number of different sciences and uh, have them learn and work together. Um, understanding sort of a broad range of the different sciences that feed into astrobiology and the interconnectedness of those science, uh, sciences, and then learning how to work together um, in, on interdisciplinary projects. So astrobiology, as many of you know, is an extremely interdisciplinary project, uh, uh, pr um, science. And so um, a large part of our training is in how to work across discipline boundaries and uh, make sort of, you know, bigger discoveries because of that, because you're not working within your own field. So the other question I have here is, you know, what does a typical day look like? And I was joking with Sanjoy that I didn't know what a typical day looked like, because none of my days are ever typical. Um, and I think that's true, and that's one of the things I really love about being a scientist um, in particular, is that honestly you don't know what's going to happen that day when you turn up in the morning, um, especially when you have administration uh, in your science as well. And I think that's fantastic. I mean, I've, I've been frustrated at work, uh, you know, and, and, and I've, there have been many sort of different challenges at work, but I have never, ever been bored. Um, but if I can try and give you an idea of what sort of some days might look like, um, typically, you know, I come in in the morning and I check in with Tina, our administrator, to make sure there aren't any crises that have evolved uh, overnight or anything that's come in that we need to address um, quickly. So that might involve uh, something to do with, with the students or something to do with sort of fiscal parts of, of the science project I run. Um, and then the rest of the day might involve some teaching, um, if I'm teaching that quarter, uh, meetings with my graduate students to go over their scientific research. And that um, is really the best and most exciting part of my day because they often have great things to show and share. And uh, so I really enjoy those. Um, and then, of course, I have the team meetings of the research group um, uh, at, at large, and so we sort of get together and also talk about what other research um, people on the team have been doing. Um, and I spend a lot of my time nowadays, at this stage in my career, reviewing things, you know, reviewing people's papers, reviewing people's proposals, um, so, uh, or reviewing proposals that have to go out, so there's a lot of administrative and academic reviewing. Um, and then at the end of all that, there's a small amount of time to work on science, um, typically not on any given day, and, and, and typically I have to kind of carve my science out in the evenings or the weekends, but I do enjoy sort of trying to keep up on that. And the summers in particular are great. But normally it's, you know, it, it's kind of the sort of day, I think some people think scientists just disappear into a lab and uh, that's all we work on, but, you know, it, it's, it looks more like a business and more like sort of, you know, again, management and administration. So why I chose astrobiology as a career? Well, um, I kind of came to astrobiology sort of in a roundabout way, as you might imagine, because um, given my stage of career, you know, astrobiology happened mid-career for me, uh, in a sense. And so I was trained as a planetary astronomer, in fact, so someone who could observe uh, planets in our solar system and try and understand what their environments were like. 
So it's not too much of a leap for me to sort of then try and apply what I've learned in that field to trying to understand what exoplanets might look like. So I started out, um, I did a PhD actually with my advisor, David Allen, in uh, uh, Sydney, Australia. And uh, he was one of the very few scientists in Australia that actually did planetary science. And so I started with him on uh, sort of more of an extragalactic type of uh, project, but I managed to convince him that really he should let me do some planetary science. So in the end, I got to look at the lower atmosphere of Venus remotely using infrared spectroscopy and uh, tr um, use that to peer down through the clouds of Venus and learn um, something about what uh, the very lower atmosphere of Venus is like, including the abundance of water there, and that also has a measure on the greenhouse effect. So all of these were kind of laying the foundation for a lot of astrobiological themes uh, uh, pertaining to habitability that I eventually got involved with. So after I graduated, um, I went to JPL to work with David Crisp, and uh, we worked on Venus and planetary science um, primarily. But while I was there, I talked to Dave about using his radiative transfer model and trying to get realistic clouds into it to try to understand the limits of the habitable zone, in particular the runaway um, greenhouse effect. So that was kind of a, a follow-on from, from the Venus work I did. And so, um, so we, we wrote that proposal. Uh, it, it ended up kind of in limbo at the time because if any of you have dealt with NASA funding, you know that sometimes things go in there but nothing ever comes out. So we weren't really sure what was happening with that. But while that was going on, um, I was uh, asked to lead uh, one of these NASA Astrobiology Institute proposals. Um, I think this was in the second round. It was the second round of the, the call. And uh, I was kind of put up to that just because I'd had these interests in potentially looking at habitability on planets. And so we put together that particular proposal, and uh, wonder of wonders, it actually won. And so that's how I started my career as an astrobiologist in the sense that, you know, I suddenly found myself being a NASA Astrobiology Institute PI and leading a group of people working on aspects of habitability on exoplanets. So it wasn't so much that I chose it as a career, I just kind of was positioned with sort of the right peripheral knowledge at the time when, you know, NASA was, was uh, calling for more participation in, in that type of um, thing. And I, I think in a general sense too, I've, I've always been interested in science fiction, and um, I watched Cosmos and Carl Sagan when I was younger and was very impressed by that, and, and that was part of what helped me decide to go into astronomy and to be interested in planets in particular. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the general, you know, way back background um, on that. Based on that introduction, you'll, you'll guess that I don't do a lot of my own hands-on uh, actual research. So I tend to live my science through my, my graduate students and, and co-workers, which is still extremely rewarding. Um, be able to do, but I'm um, actually at the moment I'm working on a very large uh, review paper on habitability, which came out of a workshop we had on revisiting the habitable zone, actually a few years ago now, uh, and I would like to get that wrapped up this summer. So I am working on actually an interdisciplinary synthesis of all of the aspects that lead to planetary habitability, and it will be a fairly sizable review paper that I hope to have um, submitted by the end of the summer. So I'm working on that, but other than that, my team. Um, my team is uh, working away on various aspects to do with um, understanding the pale blue dot, in a sense. So, um, you know, Ty Robinson on my team works, uh, had, has developed this fantastic sort of what we call Earth in a Box model that allows us to uh, visualize the Earth uh, as seen from uh, a distant observer. And so he's been working. Um, initially, he worked with the epoxy team who were a spaceflight mission that looked back at the Earth and took data, and so we worked to help analyze those data. But Ty uh, and myself are currently working with the LCROSS team, uh, which, if you remember that, that was the spacecraft that did a few uh, flybys around the Earth and then crashed itself into the moon. Um, but in the process, it got some fantastic images of the Earth that we're also analyzing with our Earth model. And in fact, uh, we are working together to help the LCROSS team calibrate their data, which is not something we would have expected from a theoretical model, but it's an, ended up being extremely productive. And so we're actually, you know, providing value added to the LCROSS data. So um, that's a bunch of things we're doing. And, and I also work on uh, sort of the impact of flares on the atmospheres of uh, extrasolar planets. That's with Antigona Segura and Lucian Walkowicz. And uh, that's in incredible fun. You know, we, we put a a huge flare into the upper atmosphere of a planet and try and figure out what that actually does to the photochemistry and uh, the, the effect for life on the surface of the planet. 
So um, maybe I will finish there. There's a bunch of other things I could talk about in my booth, and I will maybe go to the question. So one of the questions here is on the topic of Cosmos. How do you feel about the new Cosmos coming out with Neil deGrasse Tyson? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think I'm kind of torn about that. I think, I think the original Cosmos is a classic, and I think it's still, you know, still relevant and, and very good today. On the other hand, you know, graphics and um, special effects and everything have evolved so much that maybe it is, in fact, time for uh, a new version of this that could potentially be, you know, a little bit more uh, visually arresting. Um, so that might be that might be cool. So we'll see how that goes. So the other question I have is, what are the advantages of being an astrobiologist versus a unidisciplinary scientist? Right. Um, I think I think it's the interactions primarily, um, and also the chance to tackle questions that are so big that you couldn't possibly uh, make any headway with them as a unidisciplinary scientist. So. You know, with, within a given field, depending on when you come to that field, a lot of the really cool questions that um, may well have already been answered early on, you find that in fields, it's like people publish papers in the 60s and 70s, and you think, oh, wow, you know, it must have been great to be the first people to figure out what the clouds of Venus were made of, or, you know, that kind of aspect. Um, but, of course, in any field, as, as, as we say, research tends to open more questions than it answers. Um, you know, there still are things to do. But I think what I find from astrobiology is I can tackle huge questions like, you know, is there life on that planet? How do I figure that out? So it tends to push you really to the, to the very forefront of sciences as they're coming out and allows you to kind of be a pioneer and a groundbreaker, I think. And, and it's, it's very powerful and it's, it's enormous fun because, I mean, you know what you know, but as you work through a, a problem with other scientists, you know, you, you learn a lot. Um, so it's a great way to, to sort of learn a lot and learn broadly about different aspects that affect the problem that you're working on. And often, you know, something will just come out of left field, and that's the most fun of all, is, you know, another scientist will say, oh, well, didn't you realize that, for example, you know, methyl groups are always used in metabolism? Or, you know, some, something will come out where you think, oh, geez, that's, that's really relevant to what we're working on, and I had no idea. And the person from the other field is like, well, that's kind of obvious. But it's not till you work together as an interdisciplinary scientist that you can put all these pieces together and get, you know, a really powerful answer to a really big question. How do I balance being an administrator and a scientist? Are there aspects about doing both that you particularly like or dislike? Um, I do like both. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Um, but balancing, I, I'm not sure how good I am at balancing, but um, <laughs> I am getting better. I'm learning to say no to a lot more things. Obviously, I said yes to this, but uh, I am learning to say no, uh, which is a big part of being able to balance things. But, I mean, what I like about administration is being able to um, enable uh, new research. I mean, there's, there's a power in that that is really kind of exciting um, and, and very rewarding in being able to get projects off the ground and to do these. And, and I happen to be, I think, reasonably good at administration. And so, um, you know, that can be a very rewarding part of my job. It's also a way to um, get satisfaction fairly quickly on things. You know, some research projects can be very long and drawn out. Um, but I do also really enjoy the research. And it's, it's just kind of a nice mental break during the day to flip back from, you know, administration into science with my students and back again. So I just find it a really nice and varied type of career. So um, are there any aspects about doing both that you particularly like or dislike? About doing both together? Uh, again, being able to flip backwards and forwards. If I was doing only administration, I think I would go absolutely crazy. So, I mean, being able to have the science and, and to be able to keep in touch with that thing that you're trying to enable, um, I think is, is really, really key. Um, all right. So there are no departments of astrobiology universities. How does one find a job in the academic world as an astrobiologist? Okay, well, first I want to say that I'm really glad there are no departments of astrobiology. Um, you may think that's a strange answer, but I, I was actually in a group looking at interdisciplinarity at our university, and, and people said, well, why don't we have a department of astrobiology, and why don't we sort of, you know, to me, concretize, you know, all of these different interdisciplinary things into their own departments? And I said, um, I didn't like that because I wanted the fluidity of being able to, you know, in astrobiology, there are certain disciplines that we all now accept are part of it, but there are others that are sort of more on the fringe. Would they not be included in the Department of Astrobiology? So I'd really 
much prefer this sort of program structure where we can pull in departments as needed um, for these sorts of interdisciplinary aspects. So the moment I'm actually against kind of concretizing and trying to say, okay, put a, put a loop around and say, this is astrobiology and this is what will be in this department. But that's an aside. But how does one find a job in the academic world as an astrobiologist? Well, um, there are many, many departments um, that are, I, I've seen this evolution and now recognizing in particular in my area in exoplanets, there are a lot of astronomy departments that say, hey, we want to have an exoplanet scientist. This is really sort of an area that's expanding and growing and we can see that, that young people, young um, would-be scientists are very interested in this area. Um, and so I think you do have to, you know, again, scour the job ads, see if they mention astrobiology um, as uh, one of the things that they're particularly interested in. And I think you'll find that quite a lot of those are popping up. Um, and of course, the other thing I would recommend, of course, is the NAI's um, careers page, where they often pull in specific jobs that specifically want an astrobiologist for that. Um, the other thing, of course, is to be a stealth astrobiologist, is to come in with your, your main discipline, the discipline you were trained in, um, and then, you know, once you're in an academic position, you can start doing, you know, pretty much anything within reason. Um, and so you can uh, potentially expand out and bring your astrobiology to that department. And I know many of our students have gone out and done that sort of thing. Okay. Hi, Vicky. So from Rika. Um, along those lines, have you seen that having an astrobiology background has helped early career scientists get jobs? Or do you think there's a lingering prejudice against the field? because it's so new and because of the damage done by the arsenic paper. Okay, um, I think, and I'll just get my head back on screen here, um, I think that, um, I think being an astrobiologist is a, definitely an asset. Um, I've, I've said this before, but you know, when I was in NAIPI and we had postdocs who were um, astrobiology trained, a very large fraction of them ended up in academic positions. And, and I think it's for this reason in that if you're trained as an astrobiologist in interdisciplinary science, you are very interested in lots of other different fields and lots of other different, um, uh, you know, scientists and research. And that is very, very attractive in a faculty position. Pe people hiring faculty don't want to hire a mushroom who's going to sort of sit in their office, not interact with others, and to work only on their particular um, area of work. When people hire a faculty member, they're looking for a colleague who's going to integrate into a community and be part of a departmental um, effort. And so I think a lot of our astrobiologists, you know, are trained to be interested and inquisitive in what other people are doing. They're also excellent communicators in general. So by the time you're trained to talk across disciplines, you're very good at um, talking to and being understood, as well as asking the sort of the right questions when talking to someone from a different discipline. And so I've seen those aspects of the training really um, benefit um, and, and, you know, so whether or not the person gets tagged as an astrobiologist, they have that kind of a background. So um, as far as, you know, prejudice from sort of some of the, the things like the arsenic paper, I have not seen that. But then I'm speaking from an exoplanet perspective where I don't think that, you know, that, that hasn't really impacted us quite as much um, overall. It might be different in the biological sciences, for example. Um, but, you know, I, I think definitely it's an asset. And, and I just see the the students who are trained as astrobiologists go out and are just, I think, excellent faculty members. So how does one train to be an astrobiologist, particularly because few universities have astrobiology as a curriculum? Okay, so the, the first rule you have to learn in training as an astrobiologist is you have to have a grounding in a core discipline. That's absolutely crucial. Um, and that's because that has to be the base and the foundation from which you have something to offer to other people as part of this interdisciplinary science aspect. So you have that, but in addition to that, you are then, again, trained or, or you push yourself to interact with others, to get involved in interdisciplinary proposals and interdisciplinary work. Um, and I think, obviously, I will say that the best place to do this is at the University of Washington's Astrobiology program, but then... You know, I have to say that, but I absolutely totally believe that. Uh, but also at other, if you know, not ev everybody can come to the University of Washington, but if you're at another department um, or another, another institution, um, I think you can certainly still work on your core science. But again, look for opportunities to get involved in interdisciplinary projects. Look for opportunities to take your work to other disciplines. You know, volunteer to be, you know, give a colloquium in another department on something you think might be tangentially um, useful to them, that sort of thing. So I think, and again, attend all the astrobiology conferences that you can. Um, but 
that that would sort of be sort of a do-it-yourself try and train as an astrobiologist, but it also certainly would help, of course, to go to um, one of the departments, uh, one of sort of one of the institutions that has this type of program. And there are several. There's Penn State. There's Arizona State. Um, there's UW, uh, and there are other again other departments across the um, the country that are really starting to to understand that astrobiology is good for attracting bright young scientists, especially those with sort of very high curiosity levels who who like to be creative. Um, and I think, you know, there's still going to be a lot of opportunities. It'll come down to talking one-on-one -on -one with the person you want as your potential advisor and, and learning about the culture of that um, university. Okay. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges associated with identifying signatures life on exoplanet based on the biology we know? So, oh, there are a lot. So one of the biggest um, challenges is going to be, um, and, and we say this even in um, the sort of, non-remote non sensing sense, but if you're trying to determine whether life has had an impact on an environment, you need to understand what that environment was like in the first place. You need to understand what are the characteristics of that environment and how can I discriminate my life signal from it. So one of the biggest challenges is really going to be able to get a, a, enough of an understanding of the environment to know whether life has in fact tampered with that, has, has left its mark. Um, and I think you know, that, that that's kind of an observational issue. Uh, you know, if I've only got like one CO2 band and one O2 band, I'm not going to be able to tell very much about that environment. Um, but the other aspect, of course, we have is trying to figure out, given the diversity of different metabolisms that we have, you know, which, which of these are going to produce byproducts that will survive in an atmosphere for sufficiently long that we can actually see them remotely by a telescope um, or... Uh, you know, and, and which ones are going to produce the right spectral signatures. So there's still an awful lot of work to be done on looking at sort of alternative metabolisms and how those impact planetary environments. And at the moment, as you know, we're, we're kind of limited to those metabolisms we know about. But another thing we're trying to do is, is looking at whether there's any universality to metabolic processes or anything that we think might be indicative of, of different types of metabolisms, just in a, in a more generic sense. You know, what, what kind of an impact, say, energy-wise, and I guess, Sandra, you're probably working on some of this. Um, you know, are, are there any sort of taking one step up and just saying not just oxygenic photosynthesis or, you know, chemo autotrophy or whatever, just taking one step up and saying, okay, are there sort of very characteristic signatures of metabolism as a general class that we can, we can find? So these are some of the challenges that we're trying to work on. Um, so Grasshopper is asked, what are the most intriguing questions in astrobiology we should encourage young enthusiasts and scholars to start pursuing? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> um, well, there is a roadmap. Um, I think, so So from my perspective, uh, I, I think part of that is definitely biosignatures. I think, I think we have been focusing on habitability. This is for exoplanets, of course, speaking from my perspective. We've been focusing on... Uh, habitability, but I still think, again, there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done to push past this sort of, um, not quite dogma, but this sort of rut that we've fallen into of saying, you know, we want to see oxygen because oxygen represents, you know, oxygenic photosynthesis. I think that is maybe an extremely highly likely um, biosignature, but we need to start looking at other aspects as well and to figure out what sort of, again, are the probabilistic signs that we are going to see? What things are going to be more likely um, given a different planetary composition? Um, so I, I sort of put forward that as one of my, one of my key questions. Okay, so what's the next one? As the subject of astrobiology expands, what other subjects are up and coming that could be a potential for study? Um, okay, let me think. So... I think definitely, I, I think we still have a lot to do in the origin of life. Um, that's that's still in a, in a sort of state where, you know, we really have, again, just a lot to do in that particular area. So I think the origin of life, the evolution of metabolism, the interaction of metabolism with its environment, and then how that leads to biosignatures, these are all, I think, sort of very interesting areas for, um, for astrobiology to be in at the moment. Um, okay, so Julia's asked, when do you think we will have solid technology to be able to observe spectral signatures interesting for life? Okay, so I think, you know, our very first chance of that is going to be the James Webb Space Telescope. 
which may potentially be able to pick up um, oxygen signals, for example, um, for super Earths, or if new research we're, we're working on is, is correct, maybe even potentially for smaller planets than that. And so JWST in sort of 2018, 2019, I don't know what its current launch date is, but sometime in the next, you know, five, six, seven years, um, we may sort of get a glimpse at that first capability, but that's going to be extremely challenging for JWST. It will probably take the entire five-year mission time to be able to get sort of the required signal to noise on that sort of thing. So again, that's looking at 10 years, and that's our best bet, and maybe it's only one target. Um, other than that, there is work going on at the moment for a TPF probe mission. So that is, um, that's a mission that's capped at about a billion dollars. Um, it's going to be either Coronagraph or a Coulter. We're doing the research on that right now. It really is more of a technology demonstration, um, and we're not even sure right now whether it can get down to super Earths. We, we hope it will be able to, and that's what we're trying to drive the, the mission requirements to do. Um, and again, that will have the wavelength range to potentially pick up things like oxygen or um, methane um, for an early Earth-type planet, for example. And that, I'm not really sure exactly what the time scale for that is, but I su suspect it's sort of 10 years or more. Um, and then TPF itself, the thing we've always wanted, um, we're probably looking at, you know, another 20 to 30 years um, on that one. But that might sound a bit depressing, but on the other hand, it means that, you know, there's still time for us as astrobiologists to get in there and get the science done uh, to make sure that we understand what it is that we're going to be looking for so that we build the right instruments to look for the right signals. And, of course, to get up on the curve on how are we going to analyze this data, which we know is going to be really, really challenging when it finally comes down. So what atmospheric uh, constituents can we detect with current technology on exoplanetary atmospheres? So with current technology, we're basically doing the super Earths and um, mini Neptunes. Sorry, yeah, sorry, mini Neptunes primarily. We don't um, yet really have a super Earth with an atmosphere. Um, that we can observe in, in transit transmission. Um, and we are looking at hot Jupiters as well. So the sort of um, constituents we can detect are things like carbon dioxide, uh, methane, water vapor. Um, and th those are kind of the big three at the moment that people are, are focusing on. Um, and so that's, that's basically where we are uh, at the moment with those ones. Okay, so Julia, um, could you brief us on the current concept study going on debating between the next gen of exoplanet imagers? Well, it's, it's basically, that's the probe concept study, and it's just started. Um, so at the moment, the, the two things in contention are a TPF chronograph and a TPF type occulter. But again, these are probe class missions. So we're looking at, at most, sort of a 1.5 meter mirror, um, and, you know, a cap at a billion dollars. So that's our challenge, is to try and get you know, the best mirror um, light gathering capability and the technology to suppress um, the light. So that's really where we are. So I semi-answered your last question. Perhaps you could describe the differences between the missions. Well, at the moment, it's, it's just, you know, basically how we're going to do um, the, the nulling. So whether or not it's going to be a coronagraph concept or whether it's going to be something more like the New World's Observer with the, the flying occulter um, in, front of this, uh, in front of this spacecraft. So what technologies do you use to keep up to date with the latest research as astrobiology is so vast? <laughs> um, I, use, I use graduate students. They're, they're fantastic. So um, that's being a bit facetious. But, you know, uh, I think I guess I'm still old school. You know, people send me papers. I look on ADS. Um, my students bring to attention, you know, papers that they've found. Uh, in group meeting, we try and share papers. Um, uh, that, that we find are particularly interesting that have come up, you know, you look on Astro PH, that sort of thing. So I guess I'm I'm still using sort of old school um, type technology. I don't have any trawlers or anything out that, that find things for me. Am I optimistic that we'll find life in the next 50 years? I think, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I am. Um, as long as we can get something like TPF flying, um, and you know, as I said, there's even a chance in the next five to ten years with JWST um, that we'll be able to find something. So I think it boils down to you know how common do I think life is in the universe, and and this is one of those things where, you know, we've got this one planet, we've got this one example, we don't know how common life is, but you know that's that's what we do as astrobiologists. We're trying to figure out okay, how common is life? Is it is it everywhere? 
um, but not yet able to communicate with us. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm optimistic. It just seems, again, crazy to me that we would be the only example, given that we're you know kind of an average terrestrial planet, in what's turning out to be a not so average uh, planetary system. But but still, I think. Uh, Given the possible habitats for life out there, it would be unusual if we were the only place where life evolved, or at least originated. Um, what are your thoughts on the current science funding status and NASA drastically reducing EPO funding? Well, um, at the moment, uh, well, just in general, uh, I, of course, I think that we should be spending more money on science, especially in this country. Um, just that's just a huge, broad overview, broad brush. Is that, you know, really, we we have, I think, the capability to spend more money on science, but it just needs to become a much higher priority. At the moment, of course, we're dealing with sequestration and the budget cuts, you know, to NASA uh, as a result of that. Um, so far, it hasn't impacted astrobiology too badly, so we're kind of quietly optimistic that we might be able to ride this out. Um, we're under the same restrictions as all other NASA civil servants, um, but you know the astrobiology program has been working um, to to try and make sure that those aren't of too much impact to you know the the scientists who are being funded and the graduate students who are being supported under that. So you know, quietly optimistic at the moment, we'll be able to ride this out. It's it's not as bad as the sort of previous years when we've had our funding cut by 50%, for example, um, and that was that was a bit of a blow. So this time was sort of 5% and just trying to, to deal with that. It's, it's not quite so bad. Um, NASA drastically reducing EPO funding and farming it out to the um, Smithsonian. Um, I'm not I'm really not sure that's the right way to go. Uh, and I think there is some pushback on that. Um, and definitely, you know, what I would like to see is, is that the, the NASA EPO people understand sort of the NASA, what NASA is about, um, the importance of our science and research and have sort of the on the ground knowledge of what's going on. I, I would feel very uncomfortable about having an organization that isn't, you know, part of what we do, um, being in charge of the education and public outreach, I would worry about sort of the connection uh, between you know those who know and have lived and breathed and understand NASA science um, and you know getting that message out to to the general public. So Sarah, how do you think origin of life research and exoplanet biosynthesis research might best inform one another? Hmm. Um, I think again this might go back to sort of the universal universality of life's characteristics. If there's anything we can learn from origin of life about how life originates and comes together, um, that can then inform us on what sort of environments we should be looking for, um, you know, for, for, for ones that would originate life, and also gives us maybe a handle on, on this idea of trying to find sort of a universal biosignature, something that many metabolisms produce that we could look for um, in particular. So I think, yeah. And, and the stuff that, you know, we can feed back as, as exoplanet scientists, we also look, um, you know, VPL has looks back to the early Earth and tries to understand the different types of environments that were there. If we can help you through any of our techniques constrain what those early environments were like, then we can feed back into, you know, okay, this is what we think the very earliest um, environments were like. This is where life would have originated. So I think there's, there's definitely a feedback um, between those two areas. So, Julia, when you talk about JDWST, is that using the eclipsing method to find biosignatures or anticipating an occult will be funded eventually? Um, JWST, what I was talking about there was transit transmission spectroscopy, so that is just using JWST alone with no extra spacecraft um, and just looking at sort of light passing through the atmosphere of a planet as it transits in front of a star. Um, the occulter, I'd love to see an occulter fly in front of JWST. Um, I just don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, and I know that we're not allowed to modify JWST in any way to support that type of um, a spacecraft, like not being able to have anything to help with the alignment or whatever. So it, it looks a bit challenging. But I mean, now we have this probe study where, you know, an occulter is in um, contention as a, as a technology uh, demonstration. So that is potentially one way where you know, in a culture type mission could get a foot in the door. But again, that would not be on the same time scale as being able to put it in front of JWST. 
So I guess, Julie, at the moment, I really don't know what's happening with um, Flying a Culture with JWST, but the fact that we're sort of diverting all of our energies into this probe um, development does seem to suggest that, that maybe that's not on the table at the moment. So Julia also asks, could you describe some other exotic metabolisms that would produce a weird biosignature? Um, okay, so, um, so this was work uh, done by uh, uh, Sean Dobbo Goldman, who many of you know, um, and we looked at sulfur biosignatures and what they might do to a planetary atmosphere. And here's where we discovered something really interesting in the sense that we were expecting dimethyl sulfate or dimethyl disulfate or methylmercaptan or something would come out of those metabolisms and end up, you know, being an exotic biosignature in the atmosphere. And what we discovered and what we were kind of expecting was that, you know, these molecules are big, heavy, complex things and they tend to get photolyzed and their methyl groups get chopped off when that happens. And so we ended up with actually ethane uh, in the planetary atmosphere from a sulfur biosphere, which was not what we were expecting. Now, DMS, DMDS, and, and methylmercaptan were all there as well, but just not in quantities that were really easy to see in the spectra. But it turned out because you could chop a methyl off a large fraction of these types of mo molecules, that, that ethane, which was produced by two methyl groups, turned out being, you know, th this biosignature. And we were not expecting that. Um, so... So yeah, so there are a whole bunch of different metabolites that come out, but again, to develop a biosignature, you have to have three things. Basically, it has to be produced by life, it has to survive in the atmosphere long enough to build up to detectable levels, and it has to produce a strong spectral signature in the area that your telescope is actually going to be sensitive in. So when you put all of those three things together, you can sometimes end up with things that you didn't expect, like ethane, for example, instead of methylmercaptan. How much concern is there for false positives, particularly with the coarse resolution we currently have? Well, um, yes, false positives are going to be uh, an issue. I mean, there's, there's, there's false positives and then there's just not having enough information to be able to make a definitive um, uh, decision about whether or not life is, is actually there. And I think, and, and I try to get this across to people, that when we're looking for biosignatures on other planets, Really, we're talking about a probability game here. We're talking about, okay, you know, I, I've got these environmental characteristics. I have these odd things that I think might be due to life. But, you know, what is the probability that it's life and not some other type of process? And so we'll always be keeping that in mind. And, and false positives are definitely an area where we, again, it, prior to launching these missions, we want to know which of these signatures are truly unique. Does that never happen? Um, is, it, is it always possible that I'll be able to be fooled by something? I mean, oxygen could come from some other process like, you know, runaway greenhouse. So in all cases, we're trying to figure out not just whether or not this is a clear false positive, like, for example, uh, the red edge reflectivity of um, plants. Uh, there are some minerals, cinnabar, other, other types of minerals um, or, or uh, compounds that actually have, you know, a typical type of ref um, red edge type reflectivity. And they're just, you know, something you might find, an exotic thing you might find on the surface of a planet. So we need to know about those, but we also need to know about, okay, let's say I think I have a biosignature, but can I look for other things in the environment that might tell me that I'm being fooled um, and that this is in fact formed by some other more exotic geological process or whatever. So anyway, so uh, you're very welcome, Julia. Um, I, I, hope, I hope we do get you know, a mission that can detect life on uh, nearby planets and get us direct imaging spectroscopy sometime in my lifetime and hopefully definitely in, in your lifetime as well. OK, cool. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Um, this was fun. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, I will uh, sign off now and go and review something. <laughs> Right. Talk to you later. Okay, bye.